Hello and welcome to video one for week seven. In this video, we're going to talk about inverting transformations. And since transformations are represented by matrices, we'll talk about inverting matrices. So what do we mean by inverting transformations? Well, this is the same the idea as you might recognize from calculus if you've done that. That if we have a function, we can ask about doing the function backwards. If we have a rotation, we can rotate the same angle in the opposite direction, undo the rotation. If we have a reflection, we can undo the reflection by just doing the reflection again, getting back to where we started. The whole idea is getting back to where we started. So if I have a transformation t, then I can ask whether or not there exists a transformation s such that the composition in either direction, and I have to worry about either direction because of the non-commutativity of composition, that a priori s composed t and t composed s might be different, but s is an inverse to t if both of these compositions are the same as the identity transformation. The identity transformation is a transformation that leaves everything where it is. So if I do t and I do s, it's the same thing as leaving everything where it is. If I do s and then I do t, do t afterwards, it's the same thing as leaving everything where it is. We call then s the inverse of t and we write it as t to the negative 1, like we did with functions f to the negative 1 in calculus for the notation for an inverse. So that's in terms of transformations. Transformations are represented by matrices. So if I have a matrix M, I can also talk about a matrix inverse M to the negative one. Composition of transformations is multiplication of matrices. So if we compose things and get the identity transformation, that means the matrix multiplication should give us the identity matrix. And that's what's written on this slide, is that an inverse M inverse to a matrix M is some matrix such that when I do the matrix multiplication, on either side, I get the identity matrix in the right dimension. This only works for square matrices, so we're only going to talk about inverses for transformations that keep in the same dimension, R2 to R2 or R3 to R3. Otherwise, we can't even define this multiplication on both sides. And we get here the identity matrix, N is the, N is the domain that we are working in. So this is an N by N matrix, we're working in Rn, transformation from Rn to Rn. We multiply matrices. If we have a matrix, we can multiply on the left and the right and get the identity that is called the inverse matrix. Sometimes it exists, sometimes it doesn't. How do we actually find that out? How do we actually calculate them? All right, so again, we're starting with an n by n matrix. It has to have maximum rank, and that's one of the conditions to be a matrix inverse, and we'll see why here. How we calculate these is still using the row reduction algorithm. We'll see again and again in this course that the row reduction algorithm gives us information about matrices in all sorts of contexts. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to write the extended matrix M separated with the identity. So whatever the entries of M are, I'll write here, and then I'll write the identity matrix with its ones down the diagonal and zeros everywhere else here. So I'm going to get a 2n by n matrix, so it's going to be twice as wide. I'm going to row reduce this whole thing, so with these super long rows, all at once. So operations will happen to the entire row on both sides of the dividing line. And I'm going to try and make this side, which started with M, I'm going to try and turn it into the identity matrix. If I can, then what ends up on the other side is going to be the matrix inverse. Now, this left side, I want to turn it into the identity matrix, so it's going to have ones down the diagonal and zeros everywhere else, and here I'll get M inverse. That only happens if I have a leading one in each row. That only happens if there's a maximum number of leading ones. So that's why the matrix needs to have rank n to have an inverse. If it does, we can do this. It will row reduce to the identity, and we can use that to calculate its inverse. Before we end this video, a couple of definitions that are useful to have around. There are groups of invertible matrices. So the invertible matrices, matrices are a special class of square matrices. Lots of matrices are not invertible, but the invertible matrix, matrices form the special set. Uh, I'm using the, the word group here technically, which we'll talk about later in the class, later in the course. Group has a technical meaning in mathematics, which is a bit annoying because it's such a generic word, but a group is a special kind of set with a special kind of property. The invertible matrices do form one of these things. They form a group. And so all n by n invertible matrices are called the general linear group. It's a 19th century name originally for these. There's a lot of discussion and study on them historically. They're very important. Um, we indicate which scalars we're working with 
in, in the brackets for the general linear group. Typically, we'll be working with real numbers in this course, but you could change the scalars to any set of scalars you want. You could have the general linear group of integer matrices. You could have the general linear group of rational matrices, any kind of scalars you'd like to put there.